Joe Phillips, do you think there's any kind of limits to uh, the UK in terms of support for Ukraine, whether it's money, whether it's military assistance, jets, uh, long range missiles, whatever the request is, because whatever the request is today is going to be expanded upon tomorrow, let's be honest. I think what Tobias Elwood said earlier today, who's the chair of the um, Commons um, Select Defence Committee, Defence Select Committee, um, Conservative MP, um, former uh, army officer, and he said, um, you know, we can't keep emptying the store cupboard. We need to work in a much more unified way with our NATO partners. Um, and although, um, you know, America has given squillions compared to what the UK has given to Ukraine, we have still given a significantly more than quite a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, we've countries. led the way in a lot of ways yes, along and, Europe. Yes, and I, you know, and I think that is great. And I think, you know, of course... Do you? Do you think that was our job? Um, I think it was important at the time, but I also think rather cynically you might say that um, President Zelensky is incredibly brave, he's incredibly charismatic, he's a great communicator, he's managed to, you know, whiz round the world garnering support. And there is no doubt that, you know, we are, we've got this war on our doorstep and we should have done something in 2014 when Russia went into Crimea and we didn't. So I think there's an element of doing. But I think we have to be aware of and the danger of the emotional commitment without being sometimes a little bit hard-headed about whether we should be better off working more strategically with partners. Mm. With I'd be, I'd partners. be even more cynical, actually, and I would uh, suggest that the whole Ukrainian situation became almost like a political football with Boris Johnson using it as a way to deflect from domestic goings well, on, if you ask me. Mm. Uh, anyway, Connor, your thoughts on it all? Um, I would be worried about how long the war is going to be prolonged, not just in terms of escalation, but in terms of the vested interests who want it prolonged. Now, the amount of money that is flying out of taxpayer coffers to the military-industrial complex just to give it over to Ukraine to defend themselves, and they're perfectly entitled to defend themselves, uh, it does worry me that there's no, not going to be any end in sight because it's very profitable for the people that have the ears of politicians but don't necessarily have the interests of the Ukrainian people who have been invaded, the Russian conscripts and citizens who never wanted it, and the taxpayers of Western nations who have to foot the bill for it at heart. It, it does concern me that we seem to have a no-limits level of commitment to this when it's going to make a lot of money for some very seedy people. And we're not doing anything, you know, on the same scale to help people in Sudan or Yemen mm. or other places around the world. Um, I mean, I, I do think it's, it's a very difficult call. Um, I have to say I agree with you. I wasn't going to mention Boris Johnson because of Boris Bingo, but you brought it up first. But I do think it suited him very well to be hailed a hero um, in Ukraine when things were getting a bit ropey back home. I, I wouldn't call him a hero in this as well, because right from the off, there was a chance for peace negotiations and there were going to be some unsavoury compromises made there, but there's probably going to be at the end of this war when one side runs out anyway. And Boris specifically said to Zelensky, don't come to the negotiating table because we'll back you for as long as it takes. And frankly, even though people can say, OK, Russia shouldn't have Crimea and the Donbass regions, absolutely, the longer this has gone on, the more Ukrainian lives have been lost. So... Boris Johnson's policy has actually killed people. I do think it's fascinating when you hear the narrative around this now. This has become, um, you know, it's not Ukraine has to win the war, it's the West has to yeah. win the war. And it's like, well, hang on a second, how has that kind of happened? That well, we're in, Michael's have just been touched saying, Michelle, we are, we being the UK, are essentially at war with Russia in all but technical mm. name. Uh, is that fair? Not Precisely, but I think, you know, the West is at war with Russia, whether we like it or not, because this war is on our doorstep. And if Russia takes Ukraine, then where does it go next? You know, and that's why when we didn't do anything in Crimea, um, when there was plenty of intelligence to say that was going to happen and we stood by and let it happen, well, you know, the Russians have always, always played a long game. So we need for... Russia to be defeated, whether that's at the negotiating table or militarily. But what I found interesting is Donald Trump yeah. came out and he was saying about there needs to be more focus on not winning and losing, but more uh, focus on settlement, settling, and basically bringing this to a close to stop uh, death on all sides. He was immediately jumped upon hmm. uh, and criticised, lambasted and all the rest of it. Uh, and there doesn't, in my eyes, seem to be enough people pushing um, for this, the kind of uh, settlement, resolution, 
whatever word you want to apply to it. And I found that particularly odd, but I think I interrupted a point you were going to make. No, actually, I, I really like that point. And mainly the reason is Donald Trump doesn't have any vested financial interest in the war going on. But lots of the media companies, which are not this great channel, have large shares being owned by BlackRock. And BlackRock, the world's largest hedge fund, are currently securing loans for the Ukrainians. The longer the war goes on, the more interest the Ukrainians owe them, the more money that BlackRock makes. Again, not in the best interest of those people.